Hi all, I have another Halloween themed game to show you. It's uh, with a classic opening variation called the Frankenstein Dracula variation. And you might think, uh, what has Frankenstein Dracula got to do with Halloween? Well, I was curious, according to Wiki, the modern imagery of Halloween comes from many sources, including Christian uh, eschatology, national customs, works of Gothic and horror literature, such as the novels Frankenstein and Dracula and classic horror films such as Frankenstein and the Mummy. So, yes. Uh, so, is this variation horrific in nature? Let's have a look. Now, this is a classic game in this variation. It's uh, with one of my favourite British grandmasters, John Nunn, who actually awarded me, back in 1989, I won the Lloyds Bank Junior Under-18 Tournament, and that was one of my best days in chess ever. So I was honoured to be handed that uh, award by Dr. John, John Nunn. Uh, so let's have a look at his game. He played in 1974. He was black against Jacob Ost Hansen. So without further ado, E4 from Jacob. We have E5 from John Nunn. Knight C3, now Knight F6. And here White played Bishop C4. And this is a little bit provocative, actually. John Nunn uh, played here, knight takes e4. So this is called the Frankenstein Dracula variation. And it was actually its name was given uh, by Tim Harding, who has been uh, a major kind of expert of correspondence chess, has written much uh, stuff about correspondence chess generally as well as being a very strong correspondence player and an opening theoretician so in his 1976 book on the vienna game uh, he said it was the bloodthirstiness of the character of play that it was such that it was like a game between dracula and the frankenstein monster uh, it wouldn't have been out of place for those two to be playing this game it's rarely um, at the moment being played in high level play but uh, Wiki gives some examples. Ivanchuk used it against Vichy Anand uh, that ended in the draw. Shirov has also played it as black in a simul back in Canada 2011. Nakamura has played it in a rapid game in St. Louis against Duda. But uh, this, this is kind of a high-level game anyway. 1974, John Nunn played knight takes e4. So what's the point? Well, if knight takes e4, it runs into d5. And black will be equalizing here, whatever happens. For example, this is fantastic for black after bishop f5. Uh, so what does white actually do here? Uh, black's re really nicked uh, an important central pawn from white. Uh, if bishop takes, that just extends black's development, actually. Okay, there's a potential threat of knight f6 check. But if we just protect the queen, then black is absolutely uh, doing great out of the opening here. So this is not a very, very good idea at all to actually go in with uh, knight takes e4. So instead, white plays a direct, and you could say crude, threat, queen h5, threatening the classic checkmate. So how does black parry this? Well, we have knight d6, which hits the bishop and protects f7. So a neat, nifty-looking move. What could possibly go wrong here? Bishop b3. And here, actually, uh, the pawn is on prees at the moment. Black protects this. So if g6, that pawn could be taken with an advantage for white. So g6, just taking. And if queen e7 to pin the queen to stop the queen taking the rook. Knight f3, uh, white would have a big advantage. So it's recommended black plays knight c6. And now this is a key move uh, to try and distract this knight away from defending f7. White plays knight b5, so key move. Black now plays g6, so clearly knight takes b5, leaves f7 unprotected. Thanks very much. So g6. And white carries on relentlessly hitting f7. 
So renewing knight takes d6 check as a threat. Black volunteers the weakening of the diagonal. And in fact, white now uses that fact to create this battery, again renewing knight takes d6 check and queen f7 mating. So here the play gets really interesting and dynamic. And in fact, it's it's one of the most controversial openings going because I don't think really even our current computers really understand objectively who is better from this position after this next move from black, queen e7, offering a very, very interesting exchange sacrifice. The knight on a8 is a kind of stranded piece. Uh, white usually here now does take on c7 and takes the rook. So what on earth is the compensation of black concretely though? After b6, well, we start to see that this bishop's going to be dangerous on this diagonal. Uh, getting an important tempo on the queen. It's importantly, uh, it's protected by the knight on d6. So if we can go to d4, that's going to be really dangerous. The white king's still in the center here. White often plays the move d3. Uh, if you run this through computers, uh, yeah, you're, you're in for a treat here. <laughs> a, a great treat because knight takes b6. Basically, <laughs> You can experiment with this move at various points and see what happens, basically. It's just so complicated. Uh, sometimes it might be better to leave the knight on a8 or delay this taking on b6. Here, um, on, a, on a brief analysis, a computer might think white's doing quite well. Uh, but it gets, for example, this variation, uh, it looks as though white might be um, okay with an advantage. Uh, sealing down that diagonal, uh, but there's just so it's so rich in, in possibilities. Uh, for example, black doesn't have to commit to f4, black could play bishop g7, and then f4. And if if white plays this, maybe black has f3 unleashing this diagonal. And with, with accurate play, I don't know players with white who would play like this. But so they did. There is a resource of bishop d1 to defend uh, f3 potentially. So this is crazy stuff. I think for both sides, uh, maybe they will just fancy a wild tactical game, or it's it's a great game to play to celebrate Halloween. Frankenstein, Dracula, basically a great variation for both sides on the on the thematic days like this. Okay, so it's just hugely complex. But d3 is in this game. We have bishop b7. h4, it does have some perks. Uh, sometimes, it, you know, it's going to be supporting bishop g5 usefully, uh, which can be really dangerous, of course. Black can get time to do something about that with bishop g7 as well to, to address it with bishop f6. Uh, also, h5 might be dangerous. The vacating of um, these squares, well, you might want the queen coming back to h3 with still support for h5 later. So it's got some interesting ideas behind it. Again, you know, knight takes b6 is also interesting at any point. Uh, so f4 was played in this game, though, not bishop g7. On bishop g7, uh, this is kind of interesting, but it seems as though maybe white can, after taking on b6, weather the storm, park the queen on h3 here, and maybe claim technically at least an advantage. Uh, so anyway, f4 was played here. So this is a John Nunn uh, concept. Basically, it's it's interesting because it's it's a trying to get a, a duo of pawns here with support with bishop h6 for that pawn to be able to play e4, and that sometimes opens up lines against the king and gives the e5 square to black, and it can get extremely dangerous, and it can even support e3 later with that bishop supporting e3. So various ideas with f4, not just shutting down that bishop that's just uh, in transition. These pawns can become dangerous and give squares for the black knights. So a very, very interesting move here. Queen f3 was played, and now we have bishop h6. So this is the key idea. Uh, the rook is ready to, to roll as well to, to useful squares, potentially like e8, f8. Uh, if black had played knight d4 here, after queen h3, uh, this it seems you know these these variations are very rich and wonderful. Um, computers might think white has technically the advantage, but look at white's pieces; they seem not very harmonious and coordinated. 
So in practical sense, you know, for human chess, this is so rich in possibilities and chances for both sides, uh, as Wiki indicates. But in this game, we have Bishop h6. Now here, uh, Queen g4 was played by Jacob Ost Hansen. Maybe this is a little bit controversial. There are a few other tries in this position. Taking on b6, of course. Uh, knight e2, knight d4, this position looks uh, incredibly <laughs> uh, dynamic. If black takes this pawn, I'm wondering about the past pawn potential being being very useful for black potentially as well, uh, among other things. So it seems as though, you know, taking out this pawn, there's huge past pawn potential to be had here. So I would prefer, personally prefer black's chances here, even though if engines give white a small advantage for white, I like the past pawn potential myself there. I, I, th I think it depends on how skilled the players are to, to celebrate the, uh, the trump cards resulting from these positions. Uh, so if knight e2 instead of knight takes uh, b6, uh, as an example, knight d4, queen g4, knight takes with e4. This this is actually uh, very dangerous after e3. This is a, a John Nunn point, basically. This position, for example, extremely dangerous for white. Uh, black can get very, very active. Uh, play the king in the center. This seems extremely awkward. That's the definition of awkward. White's position there with that pawn on e3 seems uh, menacing. Black's bishops are really active. Black has a really active position. Um, bishop d2. This is uh, interesting as well, where white tries to get out of the way of things a little bit. It's crazy stuff. It really is just crazy stuff. You'd have to be, yes. Uh, up for a laugh to play this opening for either side. So anyway, in the game, Queen G4 was played, and we have E4. So with the White King in the center, of course, the Black King's in the center, but White, the White King feels a bit uh, more uh, insecure here right now. So Bishop takes F4, offering that F4 pawn, but for E takes D3 check, opening up that check, and that pawn looks dangerous. King F1. Bishop takes f4, queen takes f4, rook f8. And yeah, the king's a real target to this rook on this f file here. This looks vicious. These knights are, are ready to spring into action. White's knights, by contrast, are lazing around. <laughs> well, um, not very uh, not very convincing uh, part of the general theme and coordination with other pieces at the moment. But black's pieces, this rook is ready to roll in, in relation to the knights with knight e4 hitting f2. White's king has been torn to shreds here, it seems. The only coordination point seems a technical point, actually. The knight is securing c7 usage as a common square, and white uses that here. King e8. So black dynamically is offering that bishop. Uh, knight h3 was played. Uh, as you might suspect, taking the bishop doesn't lead to anything particularly good. Can you see what black plays here? If I give you five seconds to pause the video. Black to play here. Yes, it's a very, very strong move. It will be knight g3, check, mate. Yes, the power of the pin piece or pawn is illusionary. That will be checkmate. Uh, if f3, uh, there's a strong move here in queen c5, getting that nice common square there, lethal, threatening a mate. And if here, uh, protecting f2, knight d2, check, and, and this is going to be all over with forcing moves leading all the way to checkmate there. So uh, we have knight h3 in this position, not taking that bishop, which is clearly po poisoned. But here, very, very strong move. Can you guess, if I give you five seconds here, what would you play with black? Black unleashes a really vi uh, vicious attack. Well, knight takes f2 opening up the possibility of queen e2 check. Um, rook e1 won't help. White knight takes h3 check will drive the king and then away from e1 and then queen takes e1. So this, this is pretty helpless for white. White tries, you know, white, white takes there. Check, and now there's a lot of checks. Queen takes f2 check. Queen takes h4 check. Queen d4 check. Here, pausing for the checks for a moment, black brings in another key piece to the party. Black to play here, what will you play in this position? If I give you five seconds to pause the video. Okay, knight e5. The knight wants to come to g4 in some cases to help the queen. 
uh, we have rook h f1. If uh, rook e1 trying to pin the knight, then you know it looks as though queen h4 is hitting uh, the king and will be winning that rook. So rook e1 seems out of the question. Uh, we have rook h f1. On queen takes b7 here, just to see the mechanics, knight g4 check, queen f4 check, this all running with check will lead to mate. Uh, in that line, if king h3, then knight f2 check, queen h4 check, queen takes h1 is checkmate. So uh, not not very pleasant. So rook hf1 was tried, knight g4 check, queen e3 check, now offering the knight a really nice scientific move typical of Dr. John Nunn. I really like his precise attacking play. He told us as juniors to fight, try and find a way to kick the boot in, you know, sometimes don't let the opponent, uh, you know, come back round. This is kicking the boot in, I believe, in the extreme, queen e3 check, finding a really clinical way to drive the king up the board now. So king takes g4, a marvellous attack here. So what does black play here? H5 check, I'll give you that first move, but now black to play, five seconds, what would you play in this position? Okay, g5 check, driving the king forward, rook h8 check, the king's been driven into the position, king g6, uh, king uh, g4 runs into things like rook h4 check, uh, so that's not going to help. And the bishop's ready to roll to come to e4 here, king g6, and it does here, bishop e4 check, we have rook f5. If king g7, then queen d4 check is not just check, it's holding the rook. And if rook f6, then rook h7 check, queen takes f6, and there's nothing white can do after the token check here. That's it for white. White's well, going to be checkmated. So, um, yeah, rook f5 was played. We have bishop takes f5 check, rook f8 check, queen e4 check, queen e7 check, queen f6 check, queen h8 check. Queen h4, check, mate. An absolutely wonderful model game by one of my favourite British grandmasters, John Nunn. Uh, so, superb stuff. And in fact, there are trainable variations on this game at this excellent course. You can see it at that link, kingscrusher.tv slash Dracula in small letters, Dracula. I, I thought I'd save you typing out Frankenstein Dracula. So Dracula for short. Uh, if you want to check out an excellent uh, course on chessball with trainable interactive variations from a very, very strong United States national master, John Chernoff. He's done a really great job there explaining some of the intricacies, some of the resources, finesses, uh, subtleties of these lines. And there's a number of variations on this key you know, STEM game to check out and train on but it's a wonderful opening for great entertainment value of nothing else for both players uh, to try especially on days like today so if you get some online chess in today or in <laughs> yeah check out this variation in the Vienna okay thanks very much